Today we're going to talk about charge and current. In an all electrical phenomenon or any, any physical phenomenon, we are interested in knowing how to measure the physical characteristics of the system at hand. So to begin with measurements, we need to talk about the uh, SI system. The SI system you've been introduced to in your other uh, classes like physics and chemistry. And in the electrical and computer engineering profession, we use the SI system exclusively. We use the metric system for everything. We don't use English units or traditional units for, for anything. To begin with, if we're measuring a physical characteristic like length or mass, you know, for length we use meters and for mass we use kilograms, this allows us to quantify how large something is, like its length, or how, how heavy, how, how much mass it contains. And so uh, we need the same thing uh, when it comes to uh, electrical phenomenon. We need to measure how uh, electrical, for lack of a better word, uh, a particular object is. So everything has a, every, every physical object has a length. Um, I, I, for instance, am, am you know, one point eight meters tall and I have a mass of 90 kilograms and so that is very easy to quantify. I know exactly how big I am and how massive I am. And so you could also talk about how electrical I am. If you look at the uh, SI system they do talk about electrical. Uh, the electrical unit for the SI system is a measure of current in amperes. That's how the SI system defines it. For our purposes, we are not going to use electrical current as our fundamental definition of being electrical. We're going to talk about, you're going to use uh, charge instead. All right. So charge, let's talk about what charge is. Charge for our purposes, and again, not, it's not the way SI defines it, but it's the way that we will define it for our purposes in, in this course. Um, charge is the fundamental characteristic or adjective that describes the electrical nature of some object. All right, so it is simply an adjective, just like you can talk about how much mass something has or how big something has, what, it, what its length is. We can talk about what its charge is. It's how electrical something is. All right, for charge, the, the variable or the symbol that we need for charge is going to be uh, a Q. Q is going to be the variable we're going to use. Now charge, unlike length and mass and, 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 and temperature, uh, length, mass, temperature all, uh, have to be strictly positive. Uh, everything has mass, everything has a size, and so you must always have a positive length. All right. Uh, charge is different. Charge can be uh, positive, and it can be negative, and it can be zero. All right. So you may have a positive amount of charge. You know, your electricalness may be a positive number, or your electricalness may be a negative number. You may even ha possibly even have zero uh, charge. So uh, positive or negative, uh, and, and because of that, you know, we sometimes say there are two types of charge, positive and negative charge. You just happen to have positive amounts of charge or negative amounts of charge. Positive and negative came from Benjamin Franklin, uh, the American scientist, lived in the uh, early 18th century. So we have positive and negative charges. The units for the measuring charge is the Coulomb. The Coulomb is uh, named after the French scientist uh, Charles Augustin de Coulomb, who also lived in the uh, 18th century. And, and the Coulomb is, is is a quantity of charge. It's it's you know a measurement of charge. So if if you want to envision uh, you know, charge as being something tangible, a particle or something, if you will. A coulomb is basically the size of the bucket that you use to scoop up an amount of charge. And the definition for, the formal definition for how big a coulomb is, is, is given here on the slide and has to do with meter, uh, a particle separated by a meter in a vacuum. Um, th that definition doesn't really help us a great deal, but it just suffice to say it's a quantity, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a m an amount of charge. Uh, that you're dealing with. So if we're going to talk about part of, uh, charges and we need to have uh, objects which have charge, that possess charge so that we can t uh, use them to e exploit in our electrical systems, well we have several choices. There are several candidates that we can use and you know from your study of physics and chemistry that we have some charged particles uh, that you're familiar with. Ions of course are molecules that are, have you know missing or extra uh, electrons and so they're, they have a, a net positive or negative charge. Electrons, of course, themselves have a, um, have a charge. Uh, they're negatively charged. And, of course, also the protons have a charge. Uh, 
And so any of those three could be used as candidates and are charged uh, for, for charges in our electrical systems. For instance, your body uses ions. Your your nervous system is an electrical system and it uses ions and your basically s the salt and water combine to make some ionized particles in your body and the nervous nervous signals are sent via ion flow. Right? But ions, uh, we're going to use uh, another choice that we could use are electrons. Electrons are a really useful particle to use for charge because as you learned in Bohr's model of the atom, the electrons are in the outer uh, parts of the of the atom and they can be stripped away quite readily. Uh, protons of course are, are positively charged particles. They live in the nucleus so if we want to acquire a proton we have to split a nucleus and that's that's fission and fission is not a terribly convenient thing to do especially in the lab or in your home. So electrons are easy to get to and it, and it turns out electrons not only are easy to get to but they also have some really great properties. The charge of an electron is negative 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Doesn't look like a large amount of charge but actually compared to its mass the mass of an electron is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So although the charge of the electron is not terribly large, its mass is absolutely tiny. And if you look at the uh, charge to mass ratio of an electron, you see that it's 1.76 times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram. So as far as the mass is concerned, an electron is very densely charged. Given its weight, it's very, very chargy. If you look at it from its size, the size of an electron is believed to be about 2.8 times 10 to the minus 15 meters. Assuming that an electron is a sphere, if you were to compute its charge per volume, uh, we see it's negative 1.7 uh, times 10 to the 24 coulombs per cubic meter. So uh, mass-wise and volume-wise, electrons are incredibly densely charged objects. So electrons not only are easy to get to because they can be stripped away from the atoms, but the electrons are actually very, very chargy. In a sense, their charge characteristics far dominate their mass characteristics or their size characteristics. Their mass and size are so small they can virtually be assumed to be massless and, si and, and zero size, but the charge cannot be neglected. They're very densely charged particles. All right. Now, talking about charge, uh, you, you can't see electrons, you can't play with them, so uh, it would help also to have kind of an analogy. And so an analogy I'm going to give to you is charge is like a, you know, a quantity of charge, uh, how the adjective that just defines the charge of something is like talking about how much you know water you possess. Charge is like a quantity of water. If you have so many coulombs of charge, it's like having so many liters of water. And so for us, a charge could be boiled down to a certain number of electrons, and so charge is like water. A single electron uh, is really the smallest amount of charge that we're going to be concerned with in this, in this study, and so for us a single electron would be like an H2O molecule. If you take H2O and break it into smaller pieces, then it's no longer water. It's hydrogen, it's oxygen. You take an electron and break it up, well, it's no longer an electron. It no longer really has that wonderful charge characteristic. And real quickly, you'll hear mentioned from time to time uh, the word hole. The hole is a word used by electrical and computer engineers, and, and it, we act like the hole is a positively charged particle. It's not. It's a virtual particle. It's, virtual, it's a virtual positive particle. What a hole is, is basically, if you can imagine a, a crystal structure or, or, let's say, an egg carton. An egg carton has uh, places for uh, all the little eggs, the little electrons to reside. Well, if one of your little containers is empty, then uh, the container itself has a net positive charge as compared to what you expected it to have because there's an electron missing. Well, the place where the electron missing is a virtual positive particle. We call that a hole. So you'll hear that from time to time. A hole is not really a positive particle. We, it's just, it's actually the absence of an electron, but we kind of play like it is. So now moving on to the next concept that we need in uh, electrical computer engineering is the concept of current. And this is actually what the SI unit, SI system does define as their fundamental electrical uh, measure, but we're going to uh, base ours on charge. Current is simply charge in motion. If your charge is moving around, it's current. More specifically, current is the rate at which how much charge goes past a point during a given period of time. The variable for current is uh, I, and that's from the French word intensity. Uh, the French got to name all these things and they called it intensity, so the current variable is I. The definition of current is I is dQ dt. 
I is dQ dt. It is how much charge Q, a certain amount of charge Q, goes by in a certain period of time t. You take the difference of the, the ratio of those two, dQ dt, and that is the definition of current. Current is a rate. It is a flow rate of charge. How much charge has flowed by in a particular direction over a particular period of time. Current is a vector quantity. It must have a magnitude and a direction. So I'm interested in dQ dt, how big, how, what is the magnitude of the current. But I'm also interested in what direction the current is flowing in. Is the current flowing from left to right or right to left? Is it flowing up? Is it flowing out? What direction is it flowing in? Is the, is the charge coming or is it going? I'm very interested in that. Uh, the next, uh, the unit of measure for the current is the ampere. Ampere was named after a French uh, scientist, also from the 18th century. All right, then and one ampere is a coulomb per second. An ampere is a coulomb per second. It is a quantity of charge that flows so many coulombs in a certain period of time per second. All right. So the unit's the ampere. You hear people say amp quite a bit. That is simply slang. The official unit name is the ampere. For our analogy, if, if charge are, is like water or water molecules, then current is the flow rate. It is how much water is flowing over a given period of time. So a hydraulic current was be, would be measured in gallons per minute or, or in liters per second. And so the current coulombs per second is the quantity of charge, the coulombs, divided by the time in which it takes for that charge to move seconds, coulombs per second, which is the ampere. All right. So if you look at it, you know that, that I is dQ dt. Uh, I being dQ dt, you immediately think for a second that um, I, that it looks like that your char, your current is, is a velocity. It's got this dt in it. It's a derivative, but it's not a velocity. It's a flow rate. It's the flow rate. The velocity, and just like hydraulic, the hydraulic current is a flow rate. It doesn't tell you how fast the water is moving. If you have a very uh, large river, for instance, like the Mississippi River, it, you know, it's got some number of you know, millions of gallons per minute flowing through it. It's a huge current, huge current. It's a huge volume per time, millions of gallons per minute. But the velocity, the speed of the actual river flow may only be something like six miles per hour. So it's a slow moving river with a huge current because current's the flow rate. Likewise, the cur electrical current is the flow rate. It's how much charge flows in a given amount of time. It's not how quickly the particles, the charged particles are moving. Electrons, charged particles typically move at velocity somewhere near the speed of light. Charges move around usually at very high speeds, but the current, the flow rate, may be very, very small. So let's do some examples. All right. So we know in this case we have a charge. A particular point in space has a charge function, Q of t equals 5 coulombs. So we got a particular point in space, and we know that the charge function at this point is 5 coulombs. And the question is, what is the current? Well, we know that I is dQ dt. So for this particular case, we need to take the derivative of the time derivative of our, of our uh, charge function. And we know that that is simply a constant 5. And the time derivative of a constant 5 is 0. Uh, the 5 is in coulombs, and so we know that this is going to be 0 amps. If we have a constant charge, if the point in space has a charge function which is a constant, then the current is 0. If the charge is not changing, then there's no charges coming or going. The current must be 0. Let's do a different example. If you've got a particular point in space, and we know that the charge function as a function of time is 7 t squared. So in this particular case, q of t is 7 t squared, and that is in coulombs. And of course, t is given to us in, in, in seconds. So the current, i of t, is going to be the time derivative of our charge function, 7 t squared. And differentiate 7 t squared, you find 14 t or t is seconds. Now, the charge function was given to us in coulombs. Time is in seconds. Therefore, the units must be amperes. So the question might be, what is the current at a particular time? I at 
t equals 3 seconds? Well, that's simply going to be 14t, and it's going to be evaluated at t equals 3 seconds. And 14t at 3 seconds will be 42 amperes. 42 amperes. And one last example here is if we know the current function, maybe we're interested in how much charge has gone by our particular point in space. So here we have a point in space. It has a current function. And why is the current changing? Or we don't know. That's a mechanism we'll talk about maybe at a later date. But the current function I of t is 0 for, for negative time. And it's of 3 amperes, 3 coulombs per second for positive time. So the question is, how much charge has gone past the point between 1 and 4 seconds? Well, we know that charge, uh, excuse, the, the current is a rate. We have 0 coulombs per second flowing. Then we have 3 coulombs per second flowing. And so if we want to figure out what the, what the charge is, we know that I of t, I, is dq dt. So therefore, we can rearrange this. We know that I dt equals dq. So if we have a particular amount of current that is flowing, and it's flowing for a little, uh, s uh, little sliver of time dt, all right, 3 amperes, 3 coulombs per second, flows for a small amount of time, then I know I have 3 times that 3 times dt gives me a small amount of current, a small amount of current that has flown, uh, gone, gone by in this little uh, slither of time. So I dt is dq. So, But I'm looking for the total amount of charge. So how do I get the total amount of charge? Well, I need to take all the little dqs, all the little slithers, all the little dqs. I need to add them up. And so uh, we can quickly see that uh, the particular charge at a point in time, q, at a time t is going to be the, the integral of all the little dqs. Now, what are the dqs? Well, they're i, all right? And of course, this i can be changing. So uh, i is a function of time. We're not going to use t here. We'll use tau to avoid confusion with t in a second. And i of tau d tau. So i of tau d tau is going to be dq. So we're adding up all of the dqs, all right? These are all the dqs right there. And you add those up. Well, what dqs are we going to add up? We need to add up all of them. So we're going to start at the beginning of time and add up all of the dqs. And we're going to integrate up to, add them up until the time t we're interested in. So we end up with q of t is the integral from negative infinity to t of i of tau d tau. So to simply apply this, if I want to know what is the time function, uh, excuse me, the charge function in this problem, then, of course, uh, q of t for uh, t greater than, excuse me, t less than 0 for t less than 0, well, that simply has to be, uh, for, for all negative time, we see that the current is 0, so we're adding up a bunch of zeros, and so the charge must be 0. And then when t exceeds 0, we see that the current has turned on. We have 3 coulombs per second flowing. So we know that the it's going to be the integral or the beginning of time. Well, the current doesn't flow until 0, so we start at 0. We add up to t. Uh, the current itself is 3 amperes d tau. Right? And if you evaluate that, that's simply going to be 3t. So i of t, excuse me, q of t is going to be 3t. So what is the amount of charge? How much charge has gone by between t equals 1 and t equals 4 seconds? Well, that's simply going to be 3t evaluated at 4 and 1. All right, and that is going to be 12 coulombs minus 3 coulombs, which is 9 coulombs. So we can figure out the current. Current is dq dt, and if we want to go the other way around, q is the integral of i of tau d tau.